Hi everyone and welcome to our tour of the audiometry booths and our walkthrough of all the audiometric procedures uh, we want you to know about. So follow Ooh. us in. We're going to go to booth three. So first, you're gonna wanna ask your client about their case history. And that means asking things like what brought you into the clinic today, asking them about their medical history, their family history, and things like that. Getting an idea of uh, why they're in the clinic and what hearing or balance problems they may be experiencing. Then you can move on to the tests. Okay, so after case history is done, the first thing that an audiologist does is to look inside the client's ear. And to do this, they use an otoscope. Um, the otoscope comes with two different size tips. One is for children and one is for adults. So I can show you those right now. This is the children's one. It's smaller than the adult one. Today, for our client, we're gonna be using the adult tip. <laughs> so to put the tip on, you're going to want to screw it and you'll feel a little click. And then to turn it on the light, you just move this green button across and you see the light. All right. So um, when looking inside the individual's ear, you're looking for the tympanic membrane, which is also the eardrum. And you're looking to make sure that the ear canal is all clear, that there's nothing occluding it or blocking you from visualizing the tympanic membrane. Um, when you're looking at the eardrum, you're looking to see if there's any irritation or redness, if you see any white or splotchiness, or if you see any hole or perforation within the ear. That would be abnormal. Um, if there are any problems found, typically you would want to refer the client to an ENT um, for further testing and evaluation. Great. So, now I'll show you how to do otoscopy. Yay! Yay! So I turned it on. And on the client's head, you're going to want to pull their pinna up and back. And then you're going to want to brace with your other hand as you look in their ear, just in case their head moves around. And then look in. And I can clearly see all of the landmarks on the tympanic membrane. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, now that you're done with otoscopy and everything looks clear, you're ready to move on with testing. So I'm going to show you the emittance bridge and the different types of probes that you can put inside the ear for tympanometry and acoustic reflex testing. All right, here we have the tympanometer. This is showing us the right ear and the left ear, and you can switch between the two depending on which ear you're measuring in. This is going to go over the client's shoulder. Here is where we will attach the probe, and this is where the microphone um, goes into the client's ear. And here are different uh, probe sizes. So we're gonna put one of those inside Emily's ear and test her tympanogram. After looking inside Emily's ear and it's all clear, I'm deciding I'm going to use this size, uh, and it'll vary depending on the size of your client's ear canal, but I'm gonna go with this one and see how it works. I'm first going to attach it here and place it on the end, make sure it's nice and snug. And then same as otoscopy, I'm gonna pull up and back as I insert the probe into her ear. And we wanna make sure there is an airtight seal so none of the sound or pressure leaks. When doing tympanometry, you'll want to let the client know that they will feel some pressure in their ear and they'll hear some sounds, but it shouldn't hurt and it will be over momentarily. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin in Emily's right ear. To begin tympanometry, you want to make sure that the temp setting is selected on the emittance bridge. And then you're going to hit the start button on the left to begin the test. Great, so this is a type A tympanogram, which means everything is normal. So we see the ear canal volume is within 
about one to two cent square centimeters. And we have a peak pressure that is within a couple hundred of 100. So that's within normal limits. And we also have a compliance that is within normal limits. And we'll pop those up on the screen for you to see. Um, but that's what a normal tympanogram looks like. Um, some abnormal types of tympanograms will be a type B, which would be basically a flat line across the screen, and also a type C, which would be a much more negative peak pressure from around 250 to 300 or lower in that range. A couple other types of tympanometric configurations are type AS, which is a lower eardrum compliance, and type AD, which is a much higher uh, your drum compliance. So you'll see those as well. Make sure to do both ears before you move on to acoustic reflex test. All right, so once you completed doing tympanometry, you're going to want to move on to do acoustic reflux thresholds. So acoustic reflux thresholds tests your auditory pathway further, and you can do it in the ipsilateral ear or same ear, or you can do it with contralateral ears or both ears. Um, so this reflex system can track how well the sound is being transmitted throughout the nerves and make sure that it is functioning properly. It is done with either the probe and the stimulus presented in the same ear, or it is done when the probe and stimulus are presented within the separate ears. All right, so for reflexes, you're gonna wanna make sure that the reflex button is pressed, and here's what the screen will look like. You will want to do it at 500 and 1000 hertz, and you can just change it like this. I'll change it back, or however you please. Um, uh, the normal reflex range is between 70 to 100 dB, which is right here. And we will show you how it works. We're gonna use it on so Maggie. Here is the setup for acoustic reflex thresholds. We're using the same machine as we use for tympanometry and as you can see the probe is in her right ear which would be the right ipsilateral and when we want to do contralateral testing we would just put the stimulus into her left ear but it'd still be re recorded in the right ear. Once you have your patient all set up you're going to want to instruct them that they are going to hear some loud sounds. Um, it may be a little uncomfortable but nothing's going to hurt at all. All right, so to start, you're going to want to hit the start button to add the pressure, and then you're going to want to hit present. And as you can see, this was at 75 dBHL, and we got a presentation of 0 0.006. So this was not what we're looking for. We're looking for a 0 0.2. So we're going to go up. DBHL to an 80, and we're going to hit present again. And now we see the 0 0.02, which is what we're looking for, but we want to make sure that it has a growth pattern. So we're going to try the next level as well and hit present. And boom! We have it. So at 500 hertz in the ipsilateral ear, her threshold is at an 80. All right, so to switch to the contralateral ear, you're going to want to press this button down here. As you can see, we already saved the ipsilateral right side. This was a mistake. <laughs> but now we are on the contralateral side. Again, we're at 500 hertz and we're testing at 75 dBHL. So to start the test, we're going to hit start, and we're going to hit present, and we have no response there. So we're going to go up, we're going to hit present again, we're going to go up again, All right, so we have a response here, and now we're gonna to wanna to see the growth again. 
So we're going to go up one. And there we have it. A little tiny growth, but then we have her threshold at 90. All right, so another test that you can do after acoustic reflux thresholds is the acoustic reflux decay. So the acoustic reflux decay can indicate any decline in the contraction of your muscles in your inner ear um, or middle ear. Uh, and it, it tests to make sure that your ear can sustain a tone for a certain amount of time. So you would do this test when you are thinking that there's a possible neurological um, pathology instead. Right. So now you can see Maggie is all set up again for now the acoustic reflux decay. And for this test, you are going to want to instruct the person that they are going to now hear a loud sound for 10 seconds. They do not need to do anything for this test other than just stay relaxed and then try not to move their head. So I did already switch it to reflux decay, but to get to this setting, you're going to want to hit more and then hit reflux decay. And here we are. So to do this test, you're going to want to set the intensity of the stimulate stimulus to 10 dBSL above the contralateral reflux threshold. So Maggie's contralateral reflux threshold was a 90 dB SPL. So we are going to go 10 dB above that to 100. Oops. All right, so now that we're set here, we can do it at 500 or 1000 hertz. And then to start this test, you're going to hit start to start the pressure again, and then you're going to hit present. As seen from this image here, A and B are negative reflux decays, which are normal, and section C is a positive reflux decay, which is abnormal. All right, now that we're all done with tympanometry, acoustic reflux testing, including reflux decay, we're going to move on to air conduction threshold testing. And so we are going to be testing the client's hearing at a variety of different intensities, uh, which are perceived as volume, and frequencies, which are perceived as different pitches. So first, let me show you a few of the transducers, um, which include earphones and headphones, that we use to put sound into the client's ear. Okay, here are the different transducers that we have hanging on the wall. Uh, where you can see across to the other side of the booth. But first off, here we have the super oral headphones, which will go over the client's ear and on top of their head. And you can adjust them to fit the size of their head with these adjustments on the side. We have the insert earphones. So we will attach foam tips to the ends of these and then put them inside the client's ear and clip these on to the sides of their shirt or their collar. This is the bone conduction oscillator that'll be used for bone conduction testing, while these here are used for air conduction. And finally, we have circumoral headphones, which go around the client's ear, and these are also used for air conduction testing. For today, I think we will use these insert earphones, so let me show you how to set them up. Another option, if your client does not tolerate headphones or earphones for any reason, we have a sound field system. So those are speakers on either side of the booth that can be used for things like speech and noise testing or um, for children when they're doing uh, their audiometry and they won't have earphones in. Okay, so for insert earphones, you're going to want to put the foam tips on the end of the wires and then you'll go ahead and clip the little clips to each side of the client, making sure to put the red transducer on the right side of the client and the blue on the left side. You'll take the foam, you'll roll it between your fingers and just like for otoscopy, you'll pull the ear a little up and back as you insert it into the canal. Make sure it's snugly fit so that sound won't escape. It'll go directly into their ear. And same with the one on the right. All right. Then what you'll do is you will take 
this here. This is going to be an instrument so that the client can respond when they hear a sound. So I'll say, please take this. You're going to hear some tones. Uh, when you hear the tone, even if it is very soft, I want you to click that button when you hear it, okay? Alternatively, you can put the super oral headphones on the client. Again, making sure that this red is going on the right side. Bring it behind them and put that on top, right over their ears. Make sure, is that comfortable? Does that feel like it's on well? Hmm? All right, and then give them the same instructions as before. Okay, once you've put your earphones or headphones on the client, you're gonna walk around the booth, close the doors uh, because the room is soundproofed. You don't want any sound getting in. You'll come around to the other side of the booth. Here we have our audiometer. We'll sit down and we'll see we have a number of controls. It looks pretty overwhelming, but since we're doing pure tone audiometry with insert earphones, here is what we're going to press to get it all set up. So we're using pure tones. So we set it to tone and tone on here. We also want to make sure that we are using inserts. If you were using the over the ear headphones, you would select phone. And if we are doing bone conduction, we would select bone. Right now we're gonna start in the right ear. Okay, so now that we set those first settings up over here, we want to make sure that our frequency up here and our intensity or our decibel level volume are set to the correct settings to start the test. So to begin, we usually start at 1000 Hertz. So using these frequency buttons here on the audiometer, I will go down to 1000 and then setting the intensity level generally with someone without hearing loss um, there's no ear necessarily that we need to start in if they have normal hearing in both ears um, but if you have an individual with hearing loss you want to start in the quote-unquote better ear um, so the ear that has the lower thresholds is the one you'll start in. But for Emily, both ears are about the same, so it's fine that we just start in the right ear. And the starting level that we want to use uh, for individuals with normal hearing thresholds will be around 30 decibels um, in someone that you know to have a hearing loss. You will start a little bit higher, maybe around 50 decibels or even more depending on their level of hearing that you're aware of. But we'll start right now at 30 dB. And so the way I'll present this is I'm going to hit this button here. And once I hit that button, if Emily hears it, she'll click and her response will show up here as a little line that we can see. So I'm gonna go ahead and present. All right, that's a response. So now we'll show you what to do when you get a response, what to write down, and what to do next. Okay, so Emily just gave us a response at 30 dB at 1000 Hertz in the right ear. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to our intensity knob and we're going to turn down the intensity by 10 dB and see if Emily gives us a response there. Great, we have a response. So again, we're gonna go down 10 dB. Okay, another response. Let's go down 10 more dB. No response there. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up in steps of 5 dB when the individual doesn't give us a response. So let's go up five and present again. No response. Let's go up five more dB. And she gave us a response last time at 10 dB. And so what we're looking for is that threshold where she gives a response 50% of the time. Since she already gave us a response at 10 dB, if she gives us another response now, then that we're gonna take that as her threshold for a thousand Hertz. All right, so we have a threshold response at 10 dB for 1000 Hertz in the right ear. So we'll record that on our audiogram, which we have here. 
and we'll write it down at 1000 hertz at 10 dB. So I'll show you how we do that. Okay, here's the audiogram paper. And so we're going to write down Emily's threshold that we have at 1000 hertz, 10 dB in the right ear. So the symbols we use for this are over here. In the right ear, we're going to use for air conduction, unmasked, which means we're not putting noise into the other ear. Um, for that, we're going to use a circle. And so at 1,000, 10, we're going to write a circle because that is the threshold we obtained. Now let's switching to the left ear. We're just going to go to the routing and we'll press left. And so that'll switch over. Before the crosshairs were over on this side, now they're over on this side. And these two channels swapped. So we can still use the same knob to adjust the decibel level in that ear. Again, let's start at 30 dB and present there, see if we get any response. Okay, as we did before, let's go down 10 dB at a time. If she responds at this one, again, we're looking for 50% of the time where she takes it. And as she didn't give us a response at zero those last couple times, that's not the threshold. So if she gives us a response at five, we will take that as the threshold. Okay, looks like we have a threshold of 5 dB at 1000 hertz in the left ear. And again, we can see that in the little crosshairs on here that we'll just transfer to the sheet. We have the symbol for the left ear is an X. So at 1000 hertz, at 5 dB, we're going to write an X. Okay, and then you'll go across each of the frequencies and do that same thing. Okay, so next we're going to do bone conduction. And for that, we're going to use this oscillator. And so this is going to, instead of having the sound go through the person's ear canal and outer ear and through the middle ear, this is going to directly stimulate the middle ear through the temporal bone or the bone right next to your ear. That'll then go through the middle ear and stimulate the cochlea. So let me put it on, Emily. I'll put it with the oscillator side or this, this little machine part over here. I'm going to put it next to her or behind her ear, and I'll give you another angle when I'm over here. Um, but you're going to place it with, oh, actually, ha ha ha. Could I ask you to remove your glasses for me, please? Yeah. Perfect. You don't want anything obstructing. Um, you don't want the person chewing gum, so make sure you have a nice clear area to work with. So I'm gonna place it over your head with this part resting about on your temple. And this part going right behind the ear. Let me give you a visual. It'll come around and I'll show you. Here it is, right behind the ear. If anything, it can probably be moved up a bit because we want it right on that bone. We don't want it pushing up against the ear or making it so that um, anything is squished or out of place. But that looks pretty good. How does it feel? Does it feel like it's slipping? Feels great. All right, awesome. Okay, we're back on the other side of the booth and it's time to record some bone conduction thresholds after we finished all that air conduction. So once you have the oscillator placed and you are all set, you're going to make sure all of the settings on the audiometer are correct. So we're still using tone, um, tone here as well. And then we're going to transition to bone. And we place the oscillator on the right side, so we'll select right for these purposes. And again, um, we're going to want to set it first at an audible level. And since we already got air conduction thresholds for Emily at 1000, around 10 to 5 dB, how about we start just a bit above that? We'll start at 20 to make sure she can hear it. 
um, but not at a too loud level that will make it feel like it's vibrating on her skin. We want it to actually be heard rather than felt. So we'll start at 20 and we will present it. Okay, and same as before, once we have a response, we're going to go down by 10 dB and present again. All right, it makes sense we have a response there that is in line with her air conduction thresholds. Um, as long as the middle ear and um, inner ear are functioning well, the air conduction and bone conduction thresholds should be approximately the same. So we'll go down 10 more dB. response at zero. And so more than 50% of the time when we presented at zero, Emily gave us a response. So we can mark the right air conduction unmasked threshold at 1000 hertz at zero dB. So let's look at our symbols. It might be a little hard to see, but the right um, unmasked bone threshold is going to look like this, an arrow pointing in. And one way to remember that is that Emily's right ear is on this side and the arrow is pointing in as if it's her ear. So let's write that down at zero dB with an unmasked bone threshold right there. And ideally you would use different colors for these so you can kind of tell them apart. It looks kind of messy here but as we remember we have the zero um, the circle for the right uh, air threshold an X for the left air threshold and then on top of that, we have that threshold, um, the unmasked bone. And the, the air and bone conduction thresholds are within 10 decibels of each other. So that is a normal, um, there's no significant air bone gap. A significant air bone gap is if there was a 15 or more gap between the air conduction thresholds and the uh, bone conduction threshold. All right, so now that we've gone through the pure tone audiometry, we're gonna talk about the speech audiometry. There are a couple of different components to this, including SRT, or speech recognition threshold, SDT, which is speech detection threshold, and WRS, which is word recognition score. All right, so for the SRT, your starting level is going to be 30 dB SL above your estimated SRT. Your estimated SRT is equivalent to the pure tone averages that was collected using the pure tone audiometry. So from there, you're going to want to familiarize your client with six um, spondy words, and you're going to want to instruct them to repeat the words back to you as they hear them. If they think that they don't understand or can only hear it slightly, you still want them to try and guess what the word is. Uh, this test can be done with monitored live voice or you can do it with recorded speech. And today we're going to be doing recorded well, as speech. As you can see, I've already set it up with speech and I have a clear screen. So to choose the test type, you're going to hit test type. And right now we're doing SRT, so I'm clicking here. Again, with the word list, we want to make sure that we're doing spondees. So you have a choice of spondee A or spondee B. It doesn't matter which one that you choose as long as you choose spondees. And then we'll hit save and it will load up here. And now we're ready to start testing. So when we're looking at the audiogram that was collected, we can see in the right ear, which is the one that we're going to start with, we have thresholds 15, 10, and 10 where our pure tone average is. So this is roughly 10 dB for our pure tone average. So we are going to start presenting at 40 because it is 30 dB SL above the pure tone average with is our estimated SRT. When we present, we're going to want to familiarize six words so we can hit interrupt 
and it'll start playing and they'll say playground. And you can say whether it was right or wrong. All right, so make sure they use stop hitting interrupt so that it does not play over six words. So now that you've familiarized them, you can start finding your threshold. So for threshold seeking, you are going to go down by 10 dB steps until they miss two consecutive words. And the words that you are presenting again are the six that you familiarized. Don't go past those. So let's say that we go down to 10 dB and they miss two words. Then we are going to go back up 10 dB, present some more words, and go down in five increment steps. We go down until they miss four consecutive words. And once they miss four words, we go up 5 dB and that would be your threshold. So now that we have our 15 dbhl threshold you're going to want to make sure that you write it into the correct place on the audio moving on now we are going to find the speech awareness threshold or sat this threshold is the softest threshold that the individual is aware of the speech input being provided so they do not need to have the correct response to it so switching to a speech awareness threshold what we want to do again is take our mouse, click on test type, and do speech detection threshold. It is also called speech awareness threshold. Um, again, we are going to want to be using the spawn D list. Right, so now that we have it all set up for SDT, now we are going to look at our audiogram and see the thresholds that we're working with in the ear that we're testing. So they're all around 10 dB. So we are going to put a starting level at 0 dB because we want to do it 10 dB softer than our threshold. So starting at 0, we're going to present a word. And if they are not hearing it and they don't detect it, then we're going to go up in 5 dB increments until they do detect it. So let's say that they detect speech at 5 dBHL, then that would be their SDT. So the next speech audiometry test that we're going to discuss is the WRS or word recognition score. So with this one, you're going to want to present 15 um, words from your word list. This could be the NU6 or the CIW22. Those are very popular lists to use. From this list, you're going to mark the responses that your client makes as correct or incorrect, and your final result is going to be a percentage to tell you how well they understood at the level um, being presented. So now we are going to change to WRS. So you click your test type again. We're going to click WRS. We're going to also change our word list. So right now it's on MU6. Um, and we can either use the NU6 list or the CIW22 list. And as you can see there, we have plenty of options and you can choose any list that you want. So I'm actually gonna choose the CIDW22 list 2A. So the starting level for WRS is associated with the threshold found at 2000 Hertz. So as we can see on our audiogram, at 2000 Hertz, we have a 10 dB HL in the right ear, which is the ear that we are starting with. And according to our practicum manual, we should start 25 dB SL above that. So we are actually going to start at 35 dB HL. All right. So to start you're going to want to hit the interrupt button and as the client responds to the words, you're gonna hit either correct or incorrect dependent on if they say the word correctly back to you. For this WRS, you do not change the threshold at all. 
you're going to present 25 words and get a percentage as your result. So just a little snapshot of this. You would hit interrupt. And the guy said, say the word, pick. And maybe they got it correct. So we're going to hit correct. Say the word rule. Correct. Say the word nice. Say the word say. And incorrect. Say the word fail. Say the word stop. Say the word white. So as you can see, we did not do the full test. But you can see how it would provide and count the number of incorrect and correct responses associated with what you press. And then they show the percentage. So this person, if we were only doing a list of six words, would get a 67% at 35 dBHL in the right year. So here we have an example of an interpretation. So with this, we would say otoscopy revealed visualized tympanic membranes and clear ear canals bilaterally. Tympanometry revealed normal middle ear pressure, mobility, and ear canal volume bilaterally, so type A's. Acoustic reflux thresholds down here were within normal limits in both ipsilateral and contralateral thresholds, and the acoustic reflux decay was found to be negative across 500 and 1,000 hertz. Pure tone audiometry was conducted via the ER3A insert earphones. Testing revealed a moderately severe rising to moderate at 1,000 hertz, then sloping to moderately severe in the highest higher frequencies sensory neural hearing loss bilaterally. Speech recognition thresholds obtained using a recorded speech were in good agreement with the pure tone averages. Word recognition score obtained using a rec recorded CIW22 list indicates very poor performance with the right ear at 22% and left ear at 34% when presented at 80 dB in the right ear and 85 dB in the left ear. The uncomfortable listening level was also recorded and was found at 85 dB in the right ear and 90 dB in the left ear. And the most comfortable listening level was recorded at 75 dB in the right ear and 80 dB in the left ear. So that is what you would expect to hear when you were given a report.